to another free tutorial video. This time around, we're going to be going over a concept known as the returns attribution analysis in a leveraged buyout or LBO model. This is something that is actually not that complex, but something that you may not have seen before. And the idea is to figure out what is really driving the return, the IRR, the internal rate of return, or the money on money or MOM multiple when you have a leveraged buyout scenario like this, where you buy a company and then sell the company at some point in the future. Now, the reason that this came up is because we got a really good question the other day. I pasted in a screenshot here, but you probably can't see it that well. Essentially, it's from one of our students on the site who got this interview question about how financial sponsors make money. So in other words, how do private equity firms actually make money? The interviewer didn't want him to walk through an LBO model because he assumed that this student already knew all the steps, he wanted him to explain why it actually worked and what allowed the private equity firm to earn a return on their investment or earn a return above what they could earn elsewhere by buying and selling this company. Part of the question was, if you buy a company at a certain multiple of EBITDA and then you sell it, at that same multiple, can the deal actually work? So can you get an IRR that's above 20% or a money on money multiple that's above 3x or 2.5x? Can you actually make it work? Now, when this came up in an interview, our student said to do a dividend recap, which essentially means making the company take on more debt midway through to issue a dividend to the private equity firm. But the interviewer said in response to that, this wasn't necessarily wrong. That could be one way to make an impact and to still get a return in the scenario. But there are other ways to do it, such as having the company take on more debt and possibly doing other things. So that's our question in this tutorial. Are there other ways to boost the returns and get an acceptable IRR, even if the purchase multiple and the exit multiple are the same? Or let's go beyond just that. What if you sell the company for the same price that you bought it at. Forget about the multiples. What if the price itself is the same? Can you get a return in that scenario? And the answer, as you've probably guessed by now, is yes. But let's go through why it's yes in a few slides first, and then let's come back to Excel and fill this out, and I'm going to show you exactly how to calculate this. So we have this concept of the returns attribution analysis, which tells us how reliable our model is, and then how certain we can be of the returns. Because the truth is that in a leveraged buyout, there are really three ways that you can get returns. The business itself can grow. So in other words, its EBITDA can be higher in year three or year five, or whenever you go to sell it, than it was when you purchased the company. Or you can have multiple expansion. So you buy it for 8x EBITDA, but you sell it for 10x EBITDA. It's sort of like if you buy a house for $800 per square foot or 800 whatever currency per square meter, and then you sell it for 1,000 per square foot or 1,000 per square meter. Or you can have the company pay off more debt and possibly generate additional cash above and beyond what they need to operate in the meantime, which means that your proceeds when you go to sell the company are going to be higher. So this analysis lets us trace which source of returns we have and what makes the model work or not work. Now, ideally, most of the returns in an LBO should be from business growth, so from the EBITDA getting bigger, and then from the company's debt repayment and cash generation ability. The issue, if you bet on multiple expansion, buying low and selling high, is that it's very, very difficult to predict this in advance you can barely tell what's going to happen next year in the market, let alone three years or five years into the future. So this one comes very close to gambling, whereas the other two are more about making hedged bets where you've done some analysis and you're trying to cover yourself. It's the type of thing where if it comes along, great, but you don't want to bet the entire deal on something like this happening. Now, the implication of all these is that Yes, you can sell the company for the same multiple or the same price and still earn an acceptable IRR if the business grows enough or if they pay down enough debt 
or generate enough cash in the meantime. Now to actually analyze this, we break it out into the separate components and first we look at the contribution from EBITDA growth. To do this, we look at how much EBITDA has actually grown and then we multiply it by the EBITDA purchase multiple. So if EBITDA has grown by 100, our final year EBITDA is 100 higher and our purchase multiple was 10x, then we have 100 times 10 or 1,000 that comes from EBITDA growth. Now the intuition there is that you pay a certain amount, a certain multiple, kind of like that dollar per square foot or dollar per square meter metric for a house. But then by the end, if the company's EBITDA has grown, you've now gotten more for your money. You've paid something and you've gotten more from your money than you initially paid. And that is why you calculate it like this. With multiple expansion, as you might have guessed, you take the exit multiple, you subtract the purchase multiple, and then you multiply by the final year EBITDA. So if the final year EBITDA is 100 and the exit multiple is 12x, the purchase multiple is 10x, then you have 200 in returns that are coming from multiple expansion here. Because 12 minus 10 is 2, and 2 times 100 is 200. The intuition is you're trying to see how much more value does that final year EBITDA contribute when you get a higher value, a higher multiple for it. And then the last of these sources, the debt pay down and cash generation, you typically don't calculate this with a formula. You back into it by subtracting these other two above. So you see what the total proceeds are, subtract however much you put in, and then you subtract both of these to get the amount that comes from debt pay down and cash generation. Now the same analysis can work in much more complex models. Here's a model in one of our courses based on seven days in a hotel company in mainland China. And you can see we do basically the same thing there. We look at EBITDA growth, multiple expansion, debt pay down and cash generation. And we figure out that about two thirds is coming from EBITDA growth and about one third from debt pay down and cash generation. And there is no multiple expansion in that case. So the same analysis works no matter the complexity of the model. Let's take a look at it in a simple scenario now and fill out an LBO model and then look at what the numbers tell us at the end. So here's our model on screen. We buy the company for 10x EBITDA. We use 50% debt, 50% equity. So we have a purchase price of 1,000. We sell the company for 11x EBITDA and then we have revenue growing at 10% a 40% annual EBITDA margin, and then a few other stats on the cash flow items, depreciation, amortization, capital expenditures, the change in working capital, and a few items on the interest rate of 10% on the debt, the tax rate, and that initial cash balance of 20. So let's fill out our simple LBO model here, and then look at the exit calculations and the returns attribution at the end. For revenue, let's start there. We have 250 initially, and we're gonna make it grow by 10% per year, so let's copy that across. Now the EBITDA margin is gonna be 40% each year. So we'll take our revenue and multiply by the 40% and copy that across. Then we need to subtract our depreciation and amortization and interest. We cannot actually calculate our interest yet. So we're gonna leave that out for now. But for depreciation and amortization, we can take our revenue, put a negative sign in front, and then multiply it by DNA as a percent of revenue, the 3%. We're going to anchor that and copy that across. When we have our EBITDA and we subtract our depreciation and amortization, that gets us to EBIT. Then we subtract our interest and that gets us to our pre-tax income. So we can take our EBITDA, subtract our depreciation and amortization and our interest. Both these are going to be negative, so we can just use addition signs. Copy this across. And then we have to tax the company. So pre-tax income times our tax rate of 40%. We put a negative sign in front of this one as well. And we'll copy this across and we can get to our net income at the bottom, pre-tax income minus our taxes. So we have that. Now we need to see how much cash flow the company generates and how much debt it repays and how much cash it actually accumulates over time. So for the net income, we can link to our mini income statement and have it right there. Depreciation and amortization, we're going to link to our number on the income statement and just flip the sign. Copy that across. This is a non-cash addback. 
it saves us on taxes, but we're not paying this in cash in these periods. These correspond to prior capital expenditures, so we add them back on the cash flow statement. And then the change in working capital, for this one, this is a percent of the change in revenue. It's 15% here, so it means basically if our revenue goes up by 100, we need to spend 15 on working capital to get there in the first place. So for this one, I am going to take our year one revenue and subtract our year zero revenue and then multiply by this 15% right here, anchor that and copy this across. And then for CapEx, let's take our revenue up here and multiply by CapEx as a percent of revenue, the 4.5%. We'll anchor that and copy that across. Now our free cash flow is just going to be our net income plus our depreciation and amortization, the change in working capital and capex so we have this the amount we use for debt repayment is very simple we take the minimum between our free cash flow and then our beginning debt balance in this year so 553 in this case so if we only have 10 of debt left at the stage we're just going to repay that 10 but if we have 553 of cash flow we're going to repay 53 with our available cash flow we have that let's copy this across and then our debt balance, we're just going to subtract however much we use for debt repayment each year. Copy that across. And then for our cash balance, we're going to take our old number, and then we're going to take our free cash though and subtract the cash used for debt repayment and copy this across. So to show you how this works, let's say that we changed our percent debt used only 10%. Well, in this case, we repay that debt very quickly. Our debt balance goes to zero and then we start accumulating a huge cash balance after that. So this just handles the case where that actually happens and we don't have much debt or we repay it very quickly and then everything simply accumulates on our balance sheet to this cash balance. We don't need nearly this much cash to run the company so much of this will be considered excess cash by the end. I'm going to change this back to 50% for now just so we have it in our model. Now. The other thing that we need to do is with the debt and cash numbers in place, we need to go back up and fill in our interest. To keep things simple here, I'm just going to use our beginning debt balance. So in other words, the ending debt balance from the year before and multiply this by our interest rate of 10%. And now you can see the real impact of the leverage buyout. Our net income goes way down. Our pre-tax income goes way down because we have quite a bit in interest expense that's owed here. And you can see that we don't repay nearly as much debt by the end. We still keep the same exact cash balance. So now our exit enterprise value, we're going to take our final year EBITDA and multiply by the 11x multiple up here. And then we're going to work backwards and go from enterprise value to equity value at the end. When you go from equity value to enterprise value, you add debt and subtract cash. So when you're doing the opposite, you're going from enterprise value to equity value, you also do the opposite and you subtract debt and add cash instead. So we're assuming that it's going to be our responsibility to repay this 307 of debt and that we get back this 20 of cash at the end. So our equity proceeds here are 1,484. Now for the money on money multiple, it's just going to be this 1,484 divided by our initial equity contribution of 500. So a 3x multiple. And then the internal rate of return, the easiest way to calculate it here is to take our equity proceeds, divide by the initial contribution, raise it to the power of 1 over 5, because 5 years have passed in this model, year 1 through 5, and then subtract 1 at the end. So we get to an IRR of 24% and a multiple of 3x which are acceptable by pretty much any standard. Any private equity firm would say that these numbers look good. Now for the returns attribution. So what's responsible for these numbers? Is it all coming from multiple expansion? Is it coming from EBITDA growth? Is it coming from debt pay down and cash generation? To answer that, for the EBITDA growth, let's take our final year EBITDA, 161, and subtract our initial EBITDA that we purchased the company at of 100, and then let's multiply by that purchase multiple of 10x. Remember, going back to our slides, you want to see how much more you get for your money, and that's why you're multiplying by the purchase multiple. 
Now for multiple expansion, you want to take the exit multiple and then subtract the purchase multiple up here and then multiply by the final year EBITDA of 161. And then debt pay down and cash generation, you have to back into this. So for the total return to equity investors, we take our equity proceeds, 1,484, and then we subtract our contribution of 500 right in the beginning. You have that. And then let's take this number, subtract our EBITDA growth, and then our multiple expansion, the returns from those anyway. And that's how we get to our final answer at the end. So what does this tell us? In this case, the moral of the story is that almost two thirds of the returns are coming from EBITDA growth. If you look at the percentage here, 62%, relatively little is coming from multiple expansion and also relatively little is coming from debt pay down and cash generation. Looking at these numbers, our recommendation on this deal would be that we're somewhat positive, but we think right now a little bit too much is coming from multiple expansion right here. And we think it might be better if more were coming from debt pay down and cash generation. So one thing we might do is go back in and say, let's change the multiple to 10x. And you can see here, the IRR falls to 21 or 22%, but still acceptable. And that's helpful for letting us see what happens if there is no multiple expansion, if everything is coming from EBITDA growth and debt pay down and cash generation instead. We also might go in and look at scenarios where the company's revenue isn't growing quite as quickly. So let's say maybe 7.5% growth instead. And now you can see that EBITDA growth contributes far less and the IRR also falls. But then to compensate, maybe we could use more like 60 or 70% debt. So I'll say 65% debt here. And now you can see that our IRR goes back up and debt pay down and cash generation overall are contributing more to the returns in this case. So that's what this type of analysis can tell us. What's really driving the analysis and the model, how we could make it better, how we could reduce risk, and where the biggest risk sources are. Because if most of the returns are coming from EBITDA growth, that also means that this is a risk factor. Maybe the company won't grow as quickly. Maybe its margins will fall. If most returns are coming from debt pay down, that's a risk factor. Maybe their cash flows will become unstable. Maybe they'll need a lot of cash for something else. So it's a very, very important analysis. And it speaks directly to that question we went through in the beginning, which is how do financial sponsors make money? And now you know the answer that they make money through EBITDA growth, multiple expansion sometimes, and then debt pay down and cash generation. If you buy a company at a multiple and sell it at the same multiple, yes, you can make money on the deal. It's just that your money will have to come from the business growing or from you paying down more debt and generating more cash in the meantime.